Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of Justin the Food Entrepreneur Show. I'm Justin Bizarro. I'm your host. That's B I Z Z A R R O. For anyone who's out there, you can find us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs. And if you want to listen to us, you can find us on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. So I'm going to jump right into this. We've got a limited time because Stuart and I were talking galore before the podcast, catching up. We're going to do great things together. That's crazy how all these connections are happening. But I want to introduce Stuart Deming from Nashville, Tennessee. He represents a company called Explore LLC. We're going to get into it. Uh, he does a lot more than food and, and, and things like that. He's a hospitality entrepreneur. You guys are going to hear him again on the Justin Ryan Bizarro Show, but today we're going to specifically talk about all the great things he's doing for food entrepreneurs out there, for food in general, and the education that he's doing uh, for humans around the world. So, Stuart, I, I basically took the rabbit out of the hat for you. Sorry about that. But tell me about your story. Where'd you grow up? How'd you grow up? You grew up in a food business, basically, but not we're not a not typical to what we usually hear on this podcast, I would say. Just let's talk about your story, your family, how you grew up, how you got into the food game and, and this sort of love of hospitality that you have. Yeah, so it's a it's a story that goes way back in the day. And um, I grew up in a like blended Italian Irish family, and so uh, on my grandmother, on my mother's side, my grandmother is a full blood Italian, and then on my grandfather's side, uh, it's, he's like almost a full blooded Irishman. And so I grew up in this, this this culture of these two cultures really like despising each other for almost 30, 40 years, and uh, that was like my blended family. On my dad's side of the family, it's really like an English Scottish type, um, and so. I grew up with these different type of cultures and these backgrounds, but my, my real education came from, I uh, lived on a dairy farm until the age of about five or six years old. And I learned a lot about how, uh, how to maintain and take care of animals. I learned about the operations of a farm during that experience. And then we moved to upstate New York. That was located in uh, Wilkes-Barre, Pennsylvania, uh, that dairy farm. And then we moved to upstate New York uh, when I was the age of six. And there I just, I really started getting invested uh, basically in entrepreneurship at a young age. I started my own lawn care business at the age of six. Uh, I have I have worked, I'm 33 years old as of this recording, and I have worked probably close to 75 to 100 different types of jobs. Uh, food service, uh, hotel, I have detailed cars, I have mowed grass, I have uh, baled hay, I have done almost everything you could physically think possible besides like the oil industry and like operations of like banking or any of those type of things or technology. Uh, so I've, I've been working pretty hard in that sense, but uh, growing up in the Italian family and just seeing the level of hospitality uh, that we would have for these parties, it, it's something that really inspired me from a young age is I just wanted to be a very hospitable person like my grandparents. I wanted to be a very hospitable person like my grandma and uh, like my mom. And so that's, that's always been uh, something that's, really been curated and taught into me is the the hospitality uh i've been in the hospitality game now for approximately coming on to 20 years this is very soon i've been in uh catering for major restaurants i've been in catering for local wedding venues i've been in catering for a uh, college that i worked for i also had some classic italian training uh when i lived in italy for a year when i studied over there and um, so I've, I've been in the food scene for a long time, but then I've also been in the hospitality sector of tourism uh, for about seven years here in the city of Nashville. And I've had the opportunity to give close to 18,000 people tours of the city of Nashville that include history tours, music tours, food tours, um, uh, basically every type of tour that you can think of. I have been able to uh, produce and it showed, showed off Nashville too. So I'm in a really interesting space in Nashville because I, curate and create content on our uh, on one of our brand, brand platforms called explore.nash and i really had this vision for this company probably about seven or eight years ago was i knew content was going to be king and i knew video content was going to be so important for businesses so i uh, met my business partner aaron pennington which i think he's coming on the show sometime soon uh in his background is film and broadcasting and so we blended our two specialties of me and the hospitality, hospitality specialty and his film and broadcasting. And we started curating and creating content all about the city of Nashville. I love this. So let's talk about this. How did you like go about this? How did you figure out where to go? How did you start building this brand? 
like how do you find the right people to work with in terms of doing your research i mean talk to me about this like how do you go about this like you have this idea now how do you execute it yeah so it it's interesting so i when i came up with this this concept this business idea of uh curating valuable actionable content for people to take all the content that i create i want people to take action behind it and i also want it to be valuable and not waste people's time and so Aaron and I, like, especially when, when it comes to like restaurants and stuff that we're featuring in Nashville, it's, um, I have a policy, uh, that I would go to each restaurant three times. And that policy basically, uh, allows me to have these guardrails. If my first experience at that restaurant was terrible, I'm going to give it two other times because they could just, they could have just opened or, uh, the chef was having a bad day or, or something, something was happening that day that was wrong. And so I give every restaurant three times and then, uh, from that opinion of that restaurant, Aaron and I will discuss, hey, do we want to feature this on some of our, our social media videos? And then we say, yes, a lot of it comes from relationships that we've built over the years. And we just know a lot of operators in town that run multiple uh, locations or multiple restaurants or they have ownership into another partnership group. Uh, and so it's we, we decide, hey, we like this restaurant. OK, we want to feature this restaurant in our content for explore.nash. And that's xplr.nash. Uh, but where the really the concept came from for all of this is uh, I've, I've been doing tours, as I said, for a long time of Nashville. And I was doing food tours of downtown Nashville. And uh, I'm like, well, if this tour company would make content that's curated for social media, they could hopefully in return sell more tickets. And so I approached this big corporate company and I said, hey, you guys need to you guys need to be making content about things to do in Nashville because this market is going to be so big in the tourism space. And it is. Uh, BNA is going to have a record-breaking year of 21 million, uh, 21 million people flying in and out of the airport, which is a huge year for Nashville. And uh, so I approached this company and they said, no, that, that idea is stupid. And so thankfully, I met my business partner, Aaron, through Instagram. And I just, over the, the next few months, I cast vision saying, hey, I just want to curate and create this specific content all about Nashville. So people are not wasting their time when they come to Nashville. I agree with this. And especially in food, um, a lot of recommendations or a lot of one-offs or someone just went to the restaurant and then they do a reel or something. And you go to that restaurant and I've ran into this with the podcast. Cause I agree with you. Um, if I can go try the restaurant or I can talk to the person beforehand, or I get to know them in other ways or friend value, it helps me validate the podcast and a lot of people I reach out are either people that have been on the podcast and they recommend them now or they're people who come to me organically attracted to be on the podcast but I have to do a vetting it's not necessarily trying their food you do it in a much better way but I on my scale it's a little hard but I agree with you on the due diligence and I agree with you that not everyone should make the cut uh, but I also agree that if you're delivering a service, you do not want to just throw content out there to get followers. You need to actually have valuable content. You need to actually put the right people and the right entrepreneurs or the right food businesses forward. Um, So, I mean, how did you figure out how to differentiate yourself? Because there's so many food bloggers and so many bloggers in Nashville. It's kind of crazy. I think there's like more in Nashville than there are in New York City, which is a crazy thing for me. Like, I don't think that's exactly true. But it's enough where I'm like, holy crap, there's a lot of food bloggers, food content providers running around Nashville right now. Well, there's a few differences between me and a lot of the food bloggers or food influencers. I do know that there's probably per capita more Nashville stories are written about Nashville or or posts about Nashville than New York City. Uh, it It is tremendous to see. The, the thing that separate, there's a few things that separate us. First, uh, that tourism specialist that I am. Uh, because I have such a background in the hospitality industry, uh, from being a valet driver to being a, 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 a dish boy to being all of these smaller jobs in the hospitality field, I understand what consumers are looking for in that sense. Uh, I also feel like I'm a very relatable guy. So one thing that separates us, and we, saw, we, we did this since we started our content uh, a lot of people will do voiceovers of content. We, we believe that to show off a location, there needs to be a host. First off, that's somebody that's presentable, somebody that's knowledgeable about what's happening in that food industry. 
So there has to be a host of the video. And so if you go to our YouTube channel, explore.nash, you'll see that I'm, I'm the host of every one of these videos. And you also have to be able to uh, host it well and then also have the presentation of the food and of the images and what you're talking about. And you need to have that knowledge. So that's one thing that separates us. But then I think the, the biggest thing that separates us is Aaron's background is, is, is in film and broadcasting. And so he understands the, the brand identity. He understands the story of what needs to be told. And he also, from a consumer side of things, he understands the visuals that need to happen at these particular moments. And so th those, those are two big things that separate us. And then I, I would just even say, like, another thing that separates us is we, we have been thinking about this very long term. And uh, so our first YouTube video came out almost five years ago to the date. Uh, on Nashville. And uh, that was the brief history of Nashville. So another thing that separates us is instead of just covering food, we cover extreme, we cover a lot of history. We cover a lot of different like events. So we're, we're a holistic approach to a, a brand than just a food blogger. How did you end up in Nashville? I have a lot of comments based on what you just said, but let first tell me how you ended up in Nashville because I'm curious how you went from upstate New York to a southern state like Nashville and Tennessee. I know it's attractive. Lots of New Yorkers are moving there and Californians. But as a person that spent a significant amount of time there over the last eight months, I am just, I don't know how it's a different place to choose. Honestly, I don't know how else to describe it, particularly if you've ever lived in New York. And I've, I've lived in Georgia and I've lived in Colorado and I've lived all over the world. And I'm just, Nashville is a very unique place in a lot of ways. So how did you get there? Yeah, so I, um, uh, I'm, a, I'm a Christian. That's, that's how I define all of my life is through the lens of Christianity. And I initially moved to Nashville about 10 years ago to work for a church down in Franklin. And I had the opportunity to be over their young adult ministry. And so basically my role in hospitality, I was hosting all of their events for this church of 2,500 people uh, for about a year. And then uh, I decided my, at that, after my year contract was done, the decision was to either move back to upstate New York, which there's just really nothing happening up there. Um, and also just like it, bad childhood memories and all these things happen there. Uh, moved back to Italy where I studied and worked for the college that I studied at or stayed in Nashville. The issue with me potentially moving back to Italy uh, because it was a Christian-based school, I would have to do all of my own funding and then do that fundraising why I worked full-time in Italy. So that wasn't really an option. And first off, I just, I hate asking people for money. I'd rather work for my money all day, every day. And uh, so staying in Nashville was ultimately the reality that happened. And I started driving for Lyft and Uber. I was one of the first drivers in Nashville. I had the big pink, ugly mustache on my car uh, for Lyft. I was like the first like 10 drivers in the city. I ended up doing uh, about 230,000 or 250,000 miles in the city of Nashville. And so I'm just a sponge when it comes to information and into history. And so I just absorbed all of these stories that people were telling me about and then I had almost 15,000 passengers in my car and they would talk to me about these restaurants. And so I would start understanding like, okay, this is where the food game really is. It's because I'm taking a hundred passengers a month to these restaurants in Nashville. And guess what? I pick them up again and then I take them back to the same place. So I, I really started to understand the consumer mindset of, okay, these guys have affordable pricing. They have a very consistent menu. People enjoy this. Okay, so then I could start talking about these, these, these food restaurants more in depth because I had the knowledge from other people that I kept learning from. And uh, so over, over that period of time, I, be, I became a Lyft and Uber driver. And then I was also a church planter here in Nashville. So I helped try or I tried to plant a church in West Nashville. And basically that's starting a church from scratch, uh, which is a uh, really hard thing to do. And uh, then I uh, got into the hospitality and tourism world for a long time. I've been uh, doing private luxury tours of the city of Nashville for almost six years now. And so with, with that and with this media company, Explore LLC, we're able to combine all of that knowledge of everything I've seen in Nashville and really promote the city. I love this. Um, one of the things I will say that I was attracted to Nashville and why I went there and you know the podcast and opportunity there and the food business there is because – this the growing business exactly what you're talking about my my way of getting there was a little bit different than yours but the thing that happened really was that 
I went there because I saw this boom. I saw the popularity in food. I, I, you know, I didn't want to go back to New York, although I'm there right now as we record. And I spend a lot of time there because of all the food entrepreneurs I've connected with up here and, and doing the Foodtopia Eat, Love, Learn television show that I talk a little bit about in the podcast that we're hoping to get off the ground here relatively soon. But the thing about it is, like, I went there. There's this growing food entrepreneurs. There's a lot of people come from California. There's a lot of tourism there. And weirdly, it's like New York City meets Hollywood or Los Angeles. You have, like, Brentwood, Franklin, like, the wealthy, like, Hollywood Hills. And then you have this weird place called Nashville that's weirdly locked by a valley, by a river, by infrastructure by really bad urban planning and the only way you can, where you can go is up because there's not enough space yep. to fit everyone into the tourists and so there's a lot of food going there there's a lot of food trucks moving there with their food trucks or trailers there's a lot of people going there and giving up their other food businesses to be a part of Nashville and I will say this one of the most surprising things to me is um, for me was well i go back to how many bloggers there are how many foodies there are in nashville like that's the i know it's a weird term i don't like the term because what really is a foodie like you you're saying they're a foodie but they just eat food they know nothing about it they don't do their research they don't understand whether the person's even running a good business or not like it's just like you're putting people in a weird circumstance which is why i love that you said you were doing your due diligence because i'll give it a lack of term I will tell you the other thing that why I personally, you guys, if anyone goes on this podcast, they can see that I've done two food bloggers, two food enthusiasts, foodies on this podcast to help promote Nashville. Because one of the things that I agreed to in going to Nashville is I would help promote the food business in Nashville. And by promote, I mean by not promotion because I don't agree with it. I agree in attraction. Okay. I believe in if you have something that people really value, you have a good food. You have good personality, meaning you have good principles. Sorry, not personality. You have good food. You have good principles. You treat your people well. You you want others to succeed, even if it's succeeding more than you have. Like you build a good business, particularly in food. That love and that that feeling for the world comes out in your food. And and as someone who grew up on a farm and and steward who's been in the hospitality and even drive Uber. You'll understand that you always make more money, one, when you work hard, but the better you treat people, okay? And I don't mean being a pushover. I mean being a friend, pushing them when they need to be pushed, being hard on them when they need to be pushed. They're going down the wrong road. You got to have a straightforward conversation. But Nashville, and I love it there, and I, I believe it's going better, but one of the crazy things is sort of this southern mentality there. Um, and taking advantage of northerners, which is just like, okay, well, and tourists, like we got to stop that. Okay. Everyone's after the Mm -hmm. quick buck. The other thing is the Nashville no, which is like this really, really long way of saying yes, 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 yes. And then disappearing. It's almost like the, the longest ghost of all time. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And, um, the ghosting, I guess is the term they use. Um, not familiar. I can have a direct conversations with people. Fortunately, but um, and I don't avoid conflict, you know. Fortunately and unfortunately, depending on what's going on. But I will say that once I got down there long enough, and like, and why I, you know, I don't have like I've tried to like look at this space more decently. And you've come into our life through Stephen, who's the other co-host on Foodopia. He comes from film and TV as well, which is that's weird because we have that in common with you and Aaron and you and I. We have similar backgrounds in food and farming and being entrepreneurs at a very young age. And we also, you being an Uber, is also lets me know that you're exactly like me. Nothing's below you. You know, when I got rid of my companies and I wanted to explore business and I'm like, I need a skill in the new world of food, I'm like, fuck it, I'll DoorDash drive. Yeah, yeah. Uh, was it necessary? But I wanted the experience. I wanted to know whatever was going through. I wanted to understand these gatekeepers. And I did it in Nashville. And I've done it in Seattle and Denver now. And it's this weird way where I can go anywhere in the world and if I have time on my hands or I want money or I want a new pair of shoes and I don't want to dip into my savings, it's great. People are like, oh, it takes away the mileage on your truck or whatever. I'm like, oh, so does having it sit there. You know, yep, it's not exactly. a fucking yep. luxury vehicle. Let's let's it's not a Porsche. It's not what I do. I I have humility. I I save my money as much as possible. Um for the most part, like I like exploring and I like being prepared for opportunities and that's saving stuff, but it was crazy to me when I went in and tried to help out 
other food bloggers or foodies or food companies in Nashville. Um, it's not like anywhere else I experience, which is why I like when you're doing the educational piece, because everyone is so suspect of everyone else. And, yeah. um, and almost the food blogging world in Nashville is aggressive and nasty. And it goes by the environment of, I'm going to knock down other buildings to make my building bigger. And it's just weird rumors and everyone knows each other. I was totally blown away by it. But one of the things, and this is not to bash Nashville. That's not what I'm doing here, guys. I'm pointing out something that's very important. Hey, if I'll, you want me to bash Nashville, Justin, I can take care of that. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you know, and um, I try to be positive. But I, what I am trying to do is, like, there's a lot of positive entrepreneurs out there. There's a lot of positive individuals like you that are trying to go somewhere and reside somewhere and do the right thing. But there's a lot of bad things that go on in Nashville. There's a lot of things that happen that we're not always aware of. And a lot of what goes on in some of these promotions or the recklessness in promoting food companies or venues or whatever's going on is they don't understand what they're doing and what they're creating. And if they have 15,000 followers that they now suddenly point to a business that's like literally morally bankrupt, why do you care how good their food is? You shouldn't send people there. Like, and we're just like, no, it's about the views. It's about the instant gratification. It's about, you know, getting caught up in the outcome now and not in what the future holds or what we're doing or impact on society, humans and animals and our planet. Really? People are like, oh, well, me dealing with a morally bankrupt company is not a bad thing. And what damage am I doing? Well, think about what the employees are doing. Think about what the ego of this person's doing. If they're getting away with it and you're promoting it, they think they're doing the right thing. And we're not holding them accountable. And then when you go after the people that who are doing the right thing, who are doing it different than you, then you're now just no different than them. And um, and Nashville, unfortunately, I love it there, but I do feel there's a lot of negativity and aggression towards those trying to lead a good path and do the right thing there. Um, in your case, also, I feel like like you have a lot of good stuff going for you and you have a lot of great things, but I also can can see that it's not always bells and whistles and it's not always butterflies and rainbows. It's also hardship and there's a lot of time where you probably may go to multiple restaurants and none of them work out that meet your standards to do it on your show. And I think that's the right thing to do. I have that on this podcast. Sometimes I communicate with people. I'm like, oh my gosh, you have the wrong standards. You cannot be on my show. I've even had people come in and do their interview. And I'm like, I am not releasing your interview. You bad mouthed mm-hmm. each other on the thing. Your relationship with each other is bad. This is not modeling entrepreneurism in a thing. And, mm-hmm. and guess what? Maybe I'm Maybe I am not being freedom of speech or I'm not allowing that out there, but I'm also not allowing positivity or negativity or falsities about business to be put out there and people to think that these type of business practices make your business survive in the long run. Chasing money, chasing reels, chasing numbers, not doing the right thing, not having good content, not having honest content eventually will catch up with you. And and instead of your business just hurting, it just goes straight under and you hurt hurt everyone your community, yep. the people that work there, so on and so forth. So I'm in a commentary I, I, thing, but go on. I want to hear your yeah, thoughts I, on I, this. No, I, I think Nashville is in a really interesting place. And uh, so the average median age of Nashville right now is 34 years of age. Yep. And I would say Nashville is the gold mine of America right now. Yes. And, or the, the gold, gold rush. rush of America yep. right now. Yeah, I agree with and, that 100%. I actually just mentioned to someone on the previous podcast that exact thing, same thing. Go on. Yeah, and it, it, it's interesting to see the cultures of L.A. and New York and Chicago and how the influence of those cities is now impacting Nashville. And so you mentioned that thing of, of Southern charm. I, I believe a lot of people have very authentic Southern charm. But there's also a very false pretense of Southern charm. Um, but what's happening from a cultural standpoint now is you have these these cutthroat restaurateurs and you have these cutthroat bu- throat businesses from L.A. and New York moving here. And I've, I've gone to some of these places and I'm like, first off, your quality of your product of your food is terrible. Secondly, like you, you, you're not you're not having that collaborative attitude. Uh, that Nashville really thrives on. And so it's just, it's a really interesting thing to watch in the tourism space right now because there is 
on average, I think it's like seven new restaurants a week are opening in Nashville right now. I think that's the average. Um, and so it's crazy to see that. But it's not just restaurants that are opening in, in the tourism space or in the hospitality space. It's new luxury hotels. It's all of these Airbnbs. It's these new attractions. It's, these, it's, it's, it's the next shiny thing for Nashville. And um, so it's just a really interesting cultural place that the city is in right now. And I agree with you. I would say that one of the things I really got because I was from Denver, but ultimately people can tell I've spent a lot of time in New York, even though I grew up in Maryland, but I did grow up on a farm in, in D.C. And I have that northeastern mentality where, you know, I'm not going to stab you in the back. I'll stab you in the front and tell you I'm about to do it because I'm like, dude, yep. what the fuck are you doing? And that yep. comes off hard on southern people. But it also... I also weirdly irritate anyone from also the Northeast or California who's trying to take advantage of people because I don't put up with it and I call them out on it and I will deal with it in certain ways. And there's also the other thing I won't deal with that it doesn't matter if it's a Nashville native or it's a, a transplant or whatever. I don't deal well when people try to knock down other people or gossip about other people. It, mean, it lets me know something's going wrong with them. OK, you yeah. can say blah, blah, blah is wrong in Nashville. But when you start using names and it's like to tear someone down specifically, we can talk about something without tearing that person out. What benefit does it have oh, yeah. to of use course. the person's name? You can still talk about the subject matter. OK, yeah. and I get it. One of the reasons humans exist is our ability to gossip. That's why we've survived, because ultimately gossip's purpose was to protect us from danger during the years we needed to survive. But we've yep. twisted it into such a negative thing and almost knocking people down. And Nashville is full of that. But I think people don't realize, they think there's a scarcity. There's a scarcity thing going on, scarcity mentality. Like, oh my gosh, we're a small place and we were we only have one million people. And what are we going to do? I got news for everyone. Denver was like small as shit, maybe two million people when they legalized marijuana. Now it's six million people. That's what's happening mm -hmm. there. We're talking not a green rush, but you're talking a gold rush, and it's in hospitality and entertainment. And yep. one of the other things is we should be helping clean it up as it happens, not let it get out of control, not participate in it. The musicians need to be protected. The mm -hmm. We talked about sex trafficking, you and I, before there. Like Nashville's become a target for that as these tourists come into town and bachelor parties. It's not only bachelorette parties now. Now it's bachelor parties, you know? Yep. And and while we're supporting all of it and we're doing all this, like perfectly normal humans go there and do stupid shit. Like it's worse than Vegas. And yep. like you want to go to Nashville, be a responsible human. You know, you want to have a business in Nashville, be a responsible human. You know, because this negativity, this harassment of women, the, that the police's main function down on Broadway is to make sure women don't get harassed and, and assaulted. You know, you're better off getting st stabbing someone. You'll get away with it there because as long as it's not a woman, you're OK. But that's a really weird thing. And I'm and I'm exaggerating a little bit, but I'm dead serious about this. Like there's a serious yeah. thing where women are, are harassed on a regular basis there. And as someone who believes that in all humans, I don't like that. I think it's wrong. I don't know why you would go somewhere and do that and then go home to your wife and kids and be okay. Like, it's just mm -hmm. one of those things. And I'm, I'm down on a tangent, and this is a food entrepreneur show, but forget it. We're going down it now. And um, I, I can't put it back in the rabbit back in the hat. And um, but I think as food businesses and food entrepreneurs, since that's the space I influence, we can have influence and positivity and buzz at a rate that changes this, that we, we look at it head on. And if we know what's going on, we don't turn a blind eye or whatever. And they're like, well, what is it my business? I'm just trying to run a business. Well, run your business better. Bring attention to mm -hmm. what you're doing well so it brings attention to what's not being done well. You don't need to point a finger at someone. You just need to excel. And then by nature, people will compare it to something else that's not going well. You know? Of course. And same with the bloggers. Like, stop knocking down other people for trying to do it or, or whatever. I see a lot of them will collaborate and tag each other and do all that stuff. Cool. But then behind closed doors, they're railing on each other. Can you believe what blah, blah, blah did on the thing? And I'm like, dude, I thought you guys were just friends. You just collaborated on a post. What do you mean? Now you're going to rail on the restaurant or now you're going to rail on the other blogger or, you know, or yeah. the restaurant's like, you know, I don't give away free meals to bloggers. Good. You shouldn't. If you don't feel they're driving value and they're not the right person, don't give them a free meal. Don't feel obligated. I don't even, yeah, I don't I always, ask for free food. Like that's one of the things because I'm yeah. worried it's going to skew my opinion of them. 
and exactly. they're not going to be honest with me and they're going to know that I'm there. And so, you know, a lot of food entrepreneurs in Nashville in particular, I will go there or eat there or have their food with, and I won't even tell them. I don't even tell them afterwards. I will then go back after I've had them on the show and eat at their places. But I generally do quite a, a fact check um, on places that I live. Um, New York City is definitely one of them. Um, you know, a lot of the people I reach out to are, are word of mouth or I hear about or another food entrepreneur, like I said, who's been on the show recommends it. But, you know, I think what you're doing is essential. I think you have honest conversations. I think you do your due diligence. That's why, you know, I think we're going to do great things within the Foodtopia atmosphere as well and connecting with each other and collaborating and and bringing some more of this honesty outside of food and within food to the forefront and sub content and stuff like that like we've talked about and maybe I'm letting the cat out of the bag or and the rabbit's already out of the hat but Stuart what you're doing is so essential and I think you point people to the very right restaurants and when Steven met you and recommended it and I looked at your page I'm like holy crap we're very much in the same with what restaurants and places we go to. I'm like, are we tapping off each other? Do we follow each other? And I don't realize that I'm unintentionally, subconsciously doing the same thing he is, or is he following me and following? But the reality is, is it's not all the same exactly. We're just following the same type of people. We're doing the same yeah, type yeah. of due diligence in a different way because we don't want our reputation or whatever, and our or the people that go on our show to be fought, harmed by someone. And I don't want my reputation or me or my family to be harmed someone because I accidentally did something, okay? And I'm aware of that, and there's a selfish piece there, don't get me wrong, but it's like we need to be careful. We need to be aware of what we're doing. We need to be aware of where we're spending our money because it has a lot more power than we think it does. Yeah, and I think I think part of that comes from I have such a drive in hospitality. Uh, I, I just I want everyone to feel... And then this is how I approach everything in life. Uh, Jesus has welcomed me to his table to sit and to eat with him. I want to, I want to make sure I'm welcoming everyone to that same table so that they can participate with Jesus. And uh, that's how I view everything through the lens. And so hospitality in that sense, like I, I, I want to deal with ho- operators that are, have that type of hospitality where it's not just, Hey, at the, at the end of the day, I'm making a hundred thousand dollars on this. No, it's, they want people to have these incredible moments, these memories, these experiences where they can walk away and then 10 years from now they can go uh, to their sister or to a, a friend and say, hey, do you remember that time we ate at so-and-so in Nashville? And then they can, they can, they can remember together that experience. And so every, everything I do, the content we approach, it, it's through that lens of uh, Jesus has welcomed me to his table and now I, like, I want to participate in that same work. I like it because it's a round table. It's not a square one. There's no head of this table. Yep. We're all doing it together. Yep. And, um, you know, even though all the paintings of the Last Supper are square tables, it was, it, was, it was round. He was, he had apostles. There was time Jesus was Jesus, the leader, and there was time he was an apostle, and one of the apostles was the leader. And, he, you know, and yep. we just need to look at that from this standpoint, which is why I love what you're talking about. Talk to me about, let's just drop a few names of, because I think we can and I'm okay with it, of like some of your best experiences in Nashville, what restaurants, maybe they haven't been on my podcast and we're just talking about it, but I think it's okay now that we've established, you know, what our standards are. You know, a lot of it has to do with principles over personalities. Personalities is, oh, they have good food. They are a popular restaurant. No, we're talking about what's the principles of it. Do they do well? Do they treat people properly? Does it complement the food that they're serving? So talk to me about some of your favorite places in Nashville, some of your favorite entrepreneurs in Nashville, maybe. Uh, so, yeah, a few people in the food space come to mind immediately. And the first one, we've had him on my podcast, Nashville Daily, a few times. His name is Shane Nasby. And uh, he owned a barbecue restaurant here in town called Honey Fire Barbecue. He sold that, I think, right in the middle of the pandemic. And then he opened a mission-focused restaurant called Cletus. And uh, what they do is they're a for-profit organization that makes sure they'd be giving back to the homeless community here in Nashville. And so twice a month, they go to downtown Nashville and they feed over, I think it's over 400 homeless people in Nashville. But the mission of the restaurant exists to to help uh, an organization called People Loving Nashville. 
And uh, they have an incredible organization just and their burgers are phenomenal. They're my favorite burger in Nashville right now. Uh, the product's very consistent. Uh, my go-to on their menu is called the Skippy Taille. It's this Thai peanut butter uh, bacon burger and it, with jalapenos. It's amazing. I would highly recommend it. And uh, just the mission behind and the heart behind that restaurant. Uh, I love Shane. Uh, he's a great guy. And then another person, another couple that comes in, into mine, and I don't know if you've eaten here, Justin. It's called The Chef and I. And uh, this opened by Erica and Chris Raines. And Chris was a private chef for the Nashville Predators for a long time. And they actually, it was a love story on how this restaurant got started. And uh, basically, they met on eHarmony. And the way that Chris would uh, date Erica is he would cook for her. And she's like, hey, you need to open a restaurant. And so they opened this catering restaurant in South Nashville and just doing these catering type experiences for like higher end Nashville Predators and people like that. And then people would come into the restaurant and be like, hey, can we just sit in front of the chef and watch him cook? And he just cooks us something. And so that's how it turns into this restaurant. And they... Um, they do incredible things. They do these chef tastings where the chef is cooking in front of you and you get to learn about where the food is sourced from. You get to learn, learn about the chef. You get to have this interactive experience. Uh, last week I had the opportunity to participate in a 10 course, 10 course tasting with them and their chef. And it was like a three hour experience. And you just, you get to, you get to learn about where the food is locally sourced from or sourced in other parts of the world. You get to learn about the story of the chef. You get to learn the story of, Erica and Chris Rain. Uh, so they're, they're some of my favorite operators in town that come to mind. Um, some other business entrepreneurs, um, let's see, uh, Robert Hartline, he, he owned all of these uh, T-Mobile stores in town. Uh, there, there's so many people that I have inspiration from. I love this. Um, you know, the thing about the homeless, I'm going to touch on that. I, I do the same thing. Well, I have this thing where I donate three, I get, donate, give $3 to any homeless person I see. And I used to walk from music row where i would record for this podcast all the way down to downtown all the time to meet friends or people that i in the in in the business or musicians that i was hanging out with it uh, taught me a lot about that whole thing in nashville also that i didn't realize in time for another podcast uh to even cover that but one of the things is and actually there'll be a few of those musicians that are coming on justin ryan bizarro show um, for anyone who wants to know, like I'm trying to expand out to other entrepreneurs and any non-food entrepreneurs, particularly musicians and stuff that I met in Nashville, New York, and LA will be coming on that show. And we've already recorded some of those that'll be released as I'm recording this. Um, we have over 20 shows recorded for that. And I, like I said, um, already two Nashville musicians, uh, girls that are on Broadway are on the show, um, and done their own episode. So that's pretty cool. But um, the homeless thing, like I give three dollars. It's something I've always done, like almost my entire life since I've made money on my own. Even when I was a kid, like it was a dollar back then, but now it's three dollars because of three thirty three. Jesus, three's always been my lucky number ish. Thirty three's been my lucky number. It has to do with a movie called Rad, also, but it's also the year Jesus died. And there's a lot of significance in the number thirty three. It was the year that my life totally changed, and I had a breakthrough and you know, found the woman of my dreams and, you know, had a life and, and had stepchildren come into my life and my life really changed for the better. And I finally gained wealth by not chasing wealth. Interestingly, um, my perspective yeah. changed. I started doing the right thing. My morals and ethics that I had been really working on in my life, because I'd always been growing itself where really came into, into place. So that being said, you know, regardless of what the homeless use it for, I try to give three dollars. It's not my place. Ever so, what if they use it in drugs and alcohol? Well, is it going to keep them alive for a night? You know, or are they yeah. not going to go through a withdrawal? It's not my job to determine what they do with it. It's my job to do my part, grow the mm -hmm. world. You know, and whether you think alcohol and drugs are bad, I get it. But in that moment, it may keep them alive one moment longer. And people are like, anyone with an alcohol addiction addiction that's really, really bad, when they're going into rehab, they tell the people bringing them into rehab to give them drinks along the way to keep that going, yeah. and they'll break them of the habit. It's not yours. They yeah. need to be in a safe environment. So they need yeah. that. So if they are choosing to do that, it's not my choice or it's not for me to punch them. I'm just doing my part. I have more. I can give more. And I think everyone will find that they can give more. They just choose to go to Broadway and blow hundreds of dollars on, on tipping for the wrong reasons and alcohol. Yep. And um, 
You know, so they're said, I definitely have not been to Cletus or the chef and I am going to look them up and reach out to them. I would love to have them on the podcast or maybe the network event that we're doing in Nashville um, on June 19th. It's a Monday. It's 2 to 7 p.m. at Pins Mechanical for anyone out there. It's just outside of Broadway, main part of Broadway. It's near the um, Marriott Hotel. Um, I can't, it's, it's, in, not, it's in the neighborhood called the Gulch. Yeah, there you go. Um, yeah, Thank so. you. The yep. Gulch. Yep. I was trying to think of the name, and there's the Marriott Hotel, which is a beautiful redone train station. I think that's a beautiful property. It only costs like eight hundred dollars yeah, so a night to stay there, but yeah. So it's called that's called Union Station. It was built in 1900, and it there was the go. original train station for the city of Nashville. And then in the late 1880, or not 1880s, the 1980s, they converted it to a Marriott Hotel. Oh, that's pretty cool. I didn't know it was that old. I didn't realize Marriott had had it for that long, but it makes sense. Um, and even if eventually people see from my Instagram, I will have, there's a bunch of pictures I did and I did a photo shoot at that hotel. Um, and in the Gulch as part of the spot, as part of this podcast and Spotify and all that stuff that's going on. So that's kind of cool. Um, and promotion there and stuff like that. So those will eventually be released maybe by the time this podcast comes out. But definitely this podcast will be out because I, I've held a slot for it to help promote individuals to come meet Stuart and I and our businesses and explore. And I attract people and he attracts people that are in the light, meaning followers of God. We, we are warriors of Christ, warriors of God. We glorify him by not glorifying ourselves um, in a lot of ways. Mm-hmm. And we let the message of him speak through us. So I know that's deep for everyone, but if you really think about it, it's all of our purpose uh, to grow other humans, to grow the world around us. God put us on this planet. We're the angels that get to take care of all the other animals, plants, and stuff on it. We just have to choose to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, So, again, that's Pins Mechanical, 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. It's a huge venue. We are not – it's free, so it doesn't cost any money. You have to buy your own food and drinks. And we're just doing it to gather people and like-minded people. And oddly, maybe it helps cross-pollinate your businesses. That's what I find. And you meet like-minded people and, you know, gives people who haven't been on the show, either one of our shows, a chance to meet us. And it gives people a chance to see what we're about to do with Foodtopia by then. And the episodes we'll do in Nashville and get a sneak peek on, on what that looks like. So... Um, it kind of came out promotional. I apologize. But what I'm saying is you guys want to come to this. It's about the networking. We're not selling anything. We're just meeting up to do the right thing. And I think that's what you're talking about. It's about how do we do this? How do we find the right people? What's our mission? Are we doing it to be rich? Are we doing it to make the world better? You know, and I think solution driven individuals end up with money. Um, also, I'm not saying non-solution driven. There's plenty of greed to be people that rip off people, step on people, you know, trafficking, all that stuff that we talked about that end up with money. But I don't think they end up with wealth that I'm talking about. It's like combination of comfortability, financial freedom to build your own independence, but also spreading freedom in in the sense for all humans uh, and animals Mm -hmm. and stuff for that matter in a way and, and everyone having their purpose. We talked about farm animals that'll eat farm animals like cows will eat cows pigs will eat other animals pigs will eat pigs horses will even eat horses i know everyone thinks that those animals are great and pigs don't we eat beef and beef or eat vegetables but they don't always you know if there's a dead squirrel in the ground there's sometimes they'll fucking snack that sucker you know oh yeah yeah and Mm -hmm. um and so it's just one of those things and um you know, when you're hungry, you do a lot for food, and that's just the way it is. Mm-hmm. And all mammals can eat meat and plants. So we talked a little bit about that, not to freak everyone out, but it is true. And you and I both know we talked about it before, so I figure we should talk about it. And, um, Stuart, what do you like? What is your morals like? Talk to me about your like ethics, and you talked about living in the light, and you talked about Jesus and bringing everyone to the table. But I mean, like, how do you do that on a regular basis? Like when you get up in the morning, what motivates you? What inspires you? And what are sort of what I would say the core values that you really live by on a daily basis? Uh, So the Lord has blessed me to be the salt of the earth and the light of the world. And um, so I I wake up every morning. I, I try to have this intention. Uh, and when I pray at night, I always thank the Lord that I get to be the soul of the earth and the light of the world. And 
Um, so I have, I have that opportunity every single day and it's make, waking up and making that conscious decision. And as, as you know, with food, salt it is what brings flavors out in food. Um, and when salt is, is trampled and, and destroyed, those flavors in the food will not come out because salt brings that flavor out. And so I just have that opportunity every day to hopefully the people I get to engage with, the people I get to work with, the people I get to uh, see on a daily basis or meet for the first time, I have that brief moment to show hospitality to them. And I have that brief moment to maybe add flavor to their life. And uh, so I, I want to be, I want to be the soul of the world. And then uh, I also want to be the light to this world. Uh, this world is surrounded in darkness and there is darkness in every corner. There's darkness in every human. And we have an opportunity to be that light of God in this world and shine into that, those dark places. And so at the end of the day, that's what wakes me up. I want to take care of my family. I want to take care of my family well. And uh, that, also, that also inspires me to wake up early and get to work and, and to make things happen. I love this because true walkers in the light will never use darkness to try to shadow on darkness. If you watch it, you know, it's always funny to me, like when people are like, you know, walk in the light and don't be dark. I'm like, well, then what are you doing? What are you doing? Yeah. You know, look at yourself because, but I don't, I'm not going to say that because I don't believe that that is walking in the light. I think walking in the light is when is you shine it bright enough to brighten up or, or, show darkness show what the opposite is by leading the opposite way that's why i'm like competition is really against yourself in the business Mm -hmm. world you want to win beat yourself on a daily basis and you'll naturally beat the competition that's not you yep you know because if you try to be them all you're doing is focusing on them and putting them down and they'll always be better than you because they're an original and you're just trying to copy them and so the only way to truly knock them down then is to tear them apart yeah, and we're we're constantly evaluating as a team how can we, how can we have content that is uh, presentable, that's accurate, uh, and that's also that's also entertaining, and uh, we and the educational level of everything too. So like we, we we look at those four things and we say, okay, how can we improve this? And so Aaron is really good at stopping me uh, from saying something that could cause conflict or, uh, he's stopping. He, he's really good at that, that language barrier. And so I could say something, he, he would say, Stuart, no, we need to refilm that, but you need to make it sound better. And so we're, we're always constantly improving our content. And if, I don't know if you looked at the beginning of our content to what we've released in this last year, we, we have stepped it up a thousand fold and, uh, we have a lot of exciting things in the future coming in, in the content and sense. Uh, where can they find you and where can they find you online? Yeah, so people can follow us on YouTube or on Instagram at xplr.nash. Uh, we are currently building out the website for that right now. But we also own a tour company called Explore Tours, and you can book your ticket to a Nashville-themed walking tour. Uh, we also have another tour that you may be really interested in, Justin. It's called History and Hog, and it's the best barbecue along the Civil War Trail in Middle Tennessee. So we eat barbecue. And we, we, we uh, talk about Civil War stuff. So you can uh, book your tickets at exploretours.com uh, for that. I love this. And so the audience knows we're going to do a part two for this. I'm going to have Stuart back on. But he's we're going to do part two on the Justin Ryan Bizarro show because we're going to dive more into his business as a whole, him as an entrepreneur as a whole. And we got into a lot of weeds here. You know, there's a lot of valuable content here, but we only touched the iceberg. And I had I had some boundaries here that I – we created unintentionally and intentionally to try to keep it within the food as much as possible. But really, Stuart's entrepreneurism and his abilities and his skills and superpowers that he's developed far out go food. Like we just talked about, you have the Civil War attached to food. And I love it because the history through food is an important thing. The culture through food is an important thing. We always talk about on the Centurion Leadership Italian show with Justin Bizarro about the three E's, and I keep driving them into everyone's head. That's education. That's whether someone else gives it to you or you go get it yourself from books or whatever. There's experience, meaning if you want to go do something or you want to learn something or you want to go... Uh, try something go experience it do it and then the last one's exposure you got to expose yourself to the world you got to expose yourself to uncomfortable situations you got to expose yourself to different food to different people why it makes you a better leader it makes you a better entrepreneur it makes you a better human 
I don't know why, but that's just the way it is. We think safety is hiding behind a door and not going anywhere a lot of the time or staying in our comfort zone. It's the opposite. Safety is in the exploration, you know, in the form of exposure, experience, and education, just the basis. You know, I have 18 more E's to go along with those E's that truly drive a human into being an entrepreneur and a leader. You can go to the show to figure those out as we launch those, or I have them on my Instagram from previous posts. But you can look at it. But the main thing is that I think that you encompass that with what you're doing, and it's the key to success. Educate people, give them experience, and allow them to be exposed to something they weren't exposed to before. And that's, that's, that's the one thing I love about the tourism space and the tours that I've been able to do. Um, one of the most, most precious moments in my life, uh, was sitting inside of RCA Studio B. And this is where Elvis Presley recorded over a third of his library of music. Uh, RCA Studio B has also re- recorded 35,000 songs and a thousand of them became hit songs. So it's a, a very unique studio. But I had, I had the, the great opportunity to bring a husband and wife couple there. And he paid for a private concert inside of RCA Studio B. And so he was playing this, uh, uh, this grand piano and playing this song. And it was an incredible thing. And that person never got to experience something like that. And most people will never get to experience something like that. But that's, that's one thing I love about the tourism space is providing experiences that change their lives. I love this. Uh, one more time, can you tell us where they can find you online? Yeah, of course. Uh, so uh, it's explore.nash. That's on YouTube, Instagram, and explorenash.com. We also have a podcast called Nashville Daily Podcast that you can subscribe to on our YouTube channel. And if you want to take an in-person tour, it's exploretours.com. Yeah, and I can't wait to be on your guys' podcast either. I'm excited about that, to come down and, and come to your studio and actually record something. I think this will be badass. Um, oh, yeah. We, we look forward to having you on. And uh, thank you, Stuart, for your time. I'm sorry I was late again, so the audience knows I'm going to apologize. It was my fault. I don't like doing that. I don't like holding people up, but I did record a lot of podcasts today, and I'm trying to get a lot of content out there because I do believe once you hit get momentum, you should hit the gas, and once you have people of the light coming to you, you should help spread their light and your light um, as, as quickly as possible, not because it's a rush, but because you can influence more people that way and get more people in this world needs it because darkness is going faster than the light is, unfortunately. You know, uh, social media platforms and stuff like that have allowed that. So what Stuart's doing and bringing this positivity to the masses in such a cool form, I think is so important. So thank you, Stuart. Um, thank you, Explore Nashville, Explore LLC, all of that, what you're doing, your crew, You know, Aaron, I think it's really important, and I love you guys for what you're doing. Um, Thank you in the audience. I love you guys for listening. Again, we'll do a part two on Justin, the Justin Ryan Bizarro Show. We're also going to do an episode with him at his podcast that I will share with everyone here in the next month or so. June 19th, if you're a food entrepreneur or an entrepreneur in the Nashville area or traveling to Nashville, because I have people that are going to fly in for this event because they want to be there so bad to meet people and network. Uh, just by walk by being walkers of the light and agreeing with some of the messages we're saying. Uh, again, it's June 19th, 2 p.m. to 7 p.m. at Pins Mechanical in Nashville uh, in the Gulch. And with that being said, I'm Justin Bizarro. You can find us on Instagram at Justin the Food Entrepreneurs. You can find me on Spotify or this podcast on Spotify or wherever else you grow yourself through podcasts. And if you do want to find me, it's at Justin Bizarro, B-I-Z-Z-A-R-R-O. Thank you guys for listening in. I love you, and we're out. <laughs>